Michaela Pollock had many challenges in her early years growing up in rural Ontario. She would endure unspeakable abuse at the hands of her biological parents as an infant. But with the love and support of her foster parents, Kayla would grow up to be a caring and loving mother, an educational assistant, and a talented animal trainer. Life was good for Kayla. When the pandemic hit and the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines were available and eventually mandated in 2021, Kayla rolled up her sleeve and received two of the Pfizer injections with no issue. It was her decision to get the third Moderna COVID-19 vaccine in January of 2022 that would drastically change her life forever. The Canadian Independent traveled to Bradford, Ontario to speak with Kayla about her life living with a severe vaccine injury and the challenges she faces as a quadriplegic in a failing health system. Thank you, Kayla, for being with us today. Uh, before we begin, could you tell us what your life was like before your vaccine injury? Um, my life was really involved with a lot of animals. I worked at zoos and sanctuaries and worked with lions, monkeys, large parrots, and had a, a really um, uh, exotic lifestyle at home as well. And I was also really, really active. Um, I trained service dogs and guide dogs and um, did a lot of hiking. And of course, first and foremost, I was a mom. So um, I ended up um, quitting with all the, the big animals for safety reasons. And I ended up working at my son's school. So for the past four years before this happened, I had uh, been working at my son's school as a, uh, as a, like a, a casual EA. Could you tell us why you decided to get the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, one of the reasons I got the COVID-19 vaccine originally, and it was quite a debate about what we do. Um, I basically, a lot of it had to do with the things I was hearing on TV. So there was a lot of fear just being screamed at me by not just the TV, but also like, you know, when you hear like, the WHO is on TV telling you that this is like a deadly pandemic and, you know, people with immune disorders are going to, you know, die from COVID-19 more likely than other people. Um, you know, I was hearing about that and my dad was dying in long-term care at the time. In order to go see him, I needed the shots. In order to go to work, I needed the shots. So I received two Pfizer's and then a Moderna. I had no issues with the first two f vaccines, which were the Pfizer's, and it wasn't until the Moderna shot the booster that I began having problems. A week after receiving her third mRNA COVID-19 vaccine in January of 2022, Kayla fell to the floor, paralyzed for 30 minutes, unable to move her legs. A second episode occurred a week later, which prompted Kayla to make an appointment with a neurologist through her family doctor. On the morning of February 22, 2022, before she could see the neurologist, Kayla would wake to find that she was paralyzed from the neck down. Kayla relives this day. Um, I opened my eyes that morning, and as soon as I opened my eyes, I realized, oh, it's time to get up, you gotta get you know, get up and get going, get your coffee in you, it's time to go to school. And I went to get up and I couldn't move from the neck down. And that's when I was uh, uh, put on a stretcher and taken to South Lake Regional Health Center. Um, and um, that's when the events at South Lake started. Um, when I first arrived, originally the an ER doctor did come in to examine me. And then he took away the, uh, the, back, the backboard. So I'm like, okay, this is good because that means I'm not paralyzed. And he told me that um, this was something that often happens to people when they're upset and that I essentially, this was in my head. And the good news was that I would get better because I was essentially having an episode that was some sort of psychotic episode and that um, I'd never had any history of anything like that before, but he was telling me this, so I thought this was wonderful news. I asked him when I would get better, and he said, 
you know, it, it, it's up to you, really. Um, I'm going to have the psychiatrist uh, come and see you. So we ordered a psych consult, and he left me there. They left me there for the entire day. Um, so originally, that was the, uh, the first diagnosis. The second diagnosis, a, a doctor came to me, and he whispered in my ear, and he said, I think there's something seriously wrong with you. I do not think you're faking. And um, he said, I have a neurologist or a radiologist who's willing to read your report at home. If you go into the scanner right now, I can get that done. And I said, absolutely, because I don't think I'm crazy either. There's something really wrong with me. I am not faking this. And so I had the MRI scan. The radiologist read the report and they found a massive lesion on my spine that went basically right from the tailbone of my spine up and it was just like half an inch away from my breathing. Had I received the MRI um, first, I could be walking today because the treatment uh, is very time specific and uh, it wasn't until the next day that I even saw the uh, um, the neurologist who looked at my MRI and, and told me that I had transverse mellitus. I was starting to suspect this was vaccine related. And so um, when my boyfriend arrived at the hospital, anytime a doctor came in, I told him to record everything because I knew that uh, this made sense. This had started right after my vaccines. It made sense with the paralysis in my legs. It made sense with the diagnosis. They had to rule out MS, they had to rule out cancer, they had to rule out infection. And uh, that's when the doctor told me that uh, he was sure that this was caused by the vaccine and he'd seen many, many different uh, vaccine injuries that were just like mine. Basically, it's either a tumor that has to be removed. Less likely, very less likely tumor. Okay. Very less likely. How, so, what's a cancer workup mean? Well, it means a CT chest abdomen pelvis just to make sure there's no other areas of malignancy. Okay. So that's what that is. But most likely it's going to be probably, if I'm using my gut impression here, from the vaccine. So other people have it? Okay. Many people have it. Many? Many. Kayla would spend the next several months in the hospital and rehabilitation center. According to Kayla, staff counselors at South Lake Hospital offered medical assistance in dying on two separate occasions as an option to ending her life. Kayla considered it, but declined after some consideration. Kayla describes some of the challenges she faces on a daily basis. As far as my condition today, um, I have no feeling in my hands, so uh, I can't tell if something's hot or cold. So I'm not allowed to use the oven or the stove because I have burnt myself. I have no feeling on the back of my arms. I have no triceps, which is the muscle that you need. Like a paraplegic, for instance, someone in a wheelchair, you often see them pushing their self up out of their wheelchair and transferring somewhere else. Um, I don't have the ability to do that. Rehab didn't do a whole lot. Um, I, when I was sent home from rehab, I was told that I'd be getting a lot of personal support hours. And I got home from rehab and uh, for uh, four days straight, nobody came. Um, so I had to have a friend take four days off work and uh, you know, to deal with that. But um, I have no bowel or bladder function, so um, it has to be manually extracted by a person. Um, so people don't think of that when they think of someone who's paralyzed. They just think, you know, your legs don't work and that's your life. But um, it's really changed my life and it's not good. Every single morning when I wake up, I always dream that I am able-bodied in my dreams. 
and I wake up and I realize that this is not a dream, that I am paralyzed and it's worse than waking up on February 22nd back then because at least I had hope back then that, this, that I wasn't going to be paralyzed. Um, so that's the first thing. And then I realize I'm alone and uh, that I can't move and there's nothing I can do about it. I can't reach my meds. I can't get uh, the things I need without turning and, or which I can't do. I can't roll. So I stare at the ceiling and I pray that the worker's going to show up that day. There's not going to be an emergency or a cancellation because in that case, there's nobody to come and help me. There's nobody to come and get me up. There's, there's nothing I can do. I am fully dependent on other people that there's a shortage of in Ontario. Getting the care that is needed to simply exist has proven extremely difficult for Kayla. The government-funded organization, Home and Community Care Support Services, granted only five of the maximum 21 hours allowed for a personal support worker. After another organization advocated for Kayla, she eventually received a total of 10 hours. It is important to note that Kayla lives alone and cannot dress herself or get out of bed without this support. The Canadian Independent reached out to the HCCSS, but they declined to comment. Kayla applied a second time to the Vaccine Injury Support Program as her first application, according to the program staff, was never received. Kayla was only recently assigned a caseworker, almost two years from the date she was hospitalized. Kayla's caseworker was unable to comment on the status of her application. Kayla has lost everything, her home, time with her son, her mobility, and her freedom. Although every day is a struggle, she is hopeful and especially grateful for nonprofit organizations like Veterans for Freedom. Firstly, I just want to thank the Canadian Independent um, for taking on this story as the, the mainstream media um, isn't taking on stories like this. And um, secondly, I need to give a big thank you to, uh, to Veterans for Freedom. Um, they are a nonprofit organization who reached out to me. Um, they're a group of veterans and they've really made me feel like part of their family. So um, that's, uh, that was a big thing for me. So thank you to both of you. Thank you, Kayla.